stalls during recess in the first grade. There was this girl in my class named Tina and she always came to school in grubby clothes and she had brown smudges on her neck and on her hands. And one day our teacher, Mrs. McClure, she grabbed her arm and she yelled, did you kick Donovan? Your father told me I could spank you if I needed to. And then Mrs. McClure took a swing and smacked Tina on the bottom so hard that her feet flew up in the air. And I remember her red hair flying around. Years later, I ran into Tina and she told me that back then her mom had just left her dad and he used to lock her in the attic when she misbehaved. He could barely manage and so he gave the teachers permission to spank her at school, which was still legal in the 1970s. And by the way, it is still legal in 19 states in the US. I just remember feeling so small and powerless when I was at school. And I was born into what might be called privilege and opportunity. I like how civil rights activist Tilly Olson called it. She said it was the soil of easy growth. I was a white middle class daughter, history teacher father, a stay at home mom in Fresno, California. My father marched with Dr. King when he came to Fresno in 1964. And as a kid, I remember watching Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth documentaries. I grew up believing in justice, that I had personal value, that girls could do anything boys could do. Adults were fair and caring. And this changed when I started school. It was really scary and unpredictable and unkind. So I guess becoming a social worker appealed to the social justice streak in me and my focus on school allowed me to see justice happen in a setting where I didn't personally experience it. So I spent years as a counselor in group homes and non-public schools with emotionally and behaviorally disabled kids. And I figured when you learn how to help a kid sit in a desk instead of eating quarters and potting soil, you start to appreciate the incredible strengths that most public school students bring with them. After getting my master's in social work at UCLA, I worked for county probation. I was a child crisis worker for county mental health and I was a caseworker for the Department of Children and Family Services in Los Angeles. I remember going on home visits in gang territory in LA, and I learned how to spot flecks of shiny metal in the carpet from the burning of crack cocaine. I'll never forget, though, my first day as a school social worker. It was in Los Angeles, and when I walked into the cafeteria, just the smell made me sick to my stomach, and all of those feelings about school came flooding back. And to make it worse, it was the late 90s, the years of the Gun-Free Schools Act and zero tolerance policies, so there were metal detectors and razor wire around the school. When I'd get to work, there were usually cop cars pulled up on the curb. I remember one day at a high school that I worked at, a student had brought a gun in his backpack and it went off during class. Over the next 12 years, I was a school social worker in nine different districts and two different states, and I loved it. I loved helping kids overcome behavioral and emotional barriers to school, making school a better place for kids and for teachers. And most recently, I worked in Napa Valley Unified School District, which has about 18,000 students and 30 schools. And for 10 years, I was the school district administrator responsible for implementing PBIS, restorative practices, social emotional learning, and then student mental health programming. Uh, we built wellness centers there. When we started PBIS, students were missing over 5,000 days of school a year due to suspensions. And we were expelling so many students from our school district that one school board member told me, I was starting to wonder if we'd have any students left. So the school board became one of the first to pass a positive school climate board policy in the state of California, and actually in the nation. It required all 30 schools to implement PBIS, social emotional learning program, and restorative practices. After just two years of implementing PBIS, we cut our suspensions in half. And then as we began to integrate restorative practices, we reduced suspensions even further because we're able to make meaningful and deep connections with students and then really focus on changing behavior through accountability and dialogue. At the same time, we began to see juvenile arrests drop so dramatically in the city of Napa that I started to hear rumors that half of Juvenile Hall was closed. At the end of my 10 years there, we had reduced suspensions by 75%, expulsions by 99%, 
and every year we saved over $250,000 by keeping kids in school. In California, schools are funded by an average daily attendance. Our district was recognized by the California State Superintendent for having one of the most significant declines in suspensions and expulsions, and at the same time, we earned some of the highest school climate scores in the state. School climate surveys measure things like caring relationships, safety, violence, bullying, school connectedness, and it wasn't just one or two schools, it was all of them. All 30 schools scored between the 97th and 99th percentile in the state of California year after year. So I'll tell you, it's one thing to do a program for a year or two, go a mile wide and an inch deep. It's a whole other thing to implement in deep and long lasting ways, to change people's habits and hearts, to go a mile wide and a mile deep. I want to teach you how to do that for your students, for your schools. We need to make school a better place for all children, but especially those like Tina. Every kid should be in a predictable, safe setting where they're treated with dignity and respect and where someone believes in them. By creating a positive environment that has clear expectations, it's focused on relationships and belonging, and it's chock full of encouragement and engagement, we can make classrooms a safe, positive place and help all students succeed.